Good morning. Welcome back to Valley Focus. I'm Valerie Moore, and we have a special guest today who wears many hats. Today she is representing Food for the Hungry. Welcome to you, Beth Allen. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be here. Now, today you are here representing Food for the Hungry. Again, you do many jobs in your community service occupation here, but we're going to talk about your special uh, organization, Food for the Hungry, that you represent today. How did you get involved? I got involved with Food for the Hungry because I wanted to make a difference in the world. Uh, and this was a, a wonderful wonderful way to do it. I shipped out to um, uh, FH's operation in Bolivia and worked for four years there, um, high up in the Andes at 12,000 feet, um, doing uh, communications work, HR work, uh, helping out uh, with the um, U.S. government-funded programs there. And then I worked for six years in disaster relief uh, for Food for the Hungry and then came into the Phoenix office here. Now, what was your youth experience that you became interested in this, your life experience up to that? Up to that point, my mom and dad had both worked in uh, community development work in the Detroit area, in the greater Detroit area. So, so you, had a heart, hospital. you had a passion for community service and for yes. charitable work. Yes, and this is what we talked about at my dinner table as I was growing up. So, it so you was, had great role models. Yes, absolutely, my whole family. And uh, so it was really a dream come true to be able to do the kind of work that I'm doing today. And where are you from originally? I'm originally from southern Michigan. And how did you get to Phoenix, Arizona? Well, I, after I graduated from, um, from college in, in Michigan, I ended up working in Texas for a university for a number of years. And again, working in the community there, working uh, on the west and south side of San Antonio primarily, uh, doing volunteer work with recent immigrants to the United States and became very interested in, in what were the conditions that had caused them to immigrate in the first place and heard firsthand from them what was going on. And I really um, got into my heart that I wanted to go and, and go to the places they had come from to try to make life better there so that they didn't feel that they had to leave and come into what amounted to a very hard life in the United States after they arrived. Um, not that I wasn't glad they were there. I was glad for their friendship and, and everything, but I really was very wanting to go and, and just help out on the other side of the world. So because, I ended up with FH. Yeah, because being displaced, no matter what the good reason is, is still being displaced from your family, your roots, and your history. Absolutely. And we work with a lot of displaced people from Food for the Hungry today. As a matter of fact, as we talk more about malaria, we'll see that uh, displacement is one of the things that actually uh, exacerbates malaria in any given area. So you're a well-traveled gal who comes today to us on behalf of Food for the Hungry. And how, again, did you hear about Food for the Hungry initially? They, Food for the Hungry had been very helpful to my church in getting out on a short-term mission team. And so my pastor knew about them, and I had friends with them. And I actually had a friend who came on staff with Food for the Hungry before I did. And um, the sneaky guy that he was, he turned in my name to Food for the Hungry. I said, here's somebody who's thinking about... Uh, going into this kind of work, and we are a faith-based organization with a Christian organization, and so he, I got a phone call oh, from Food all for the took. Hungry. That's all it <laughs> took. I got a phone call, and we talked for about two years, um, just about you know what would be appropriate. I went through some training and ended up getting placed with Food for the Hungry as a result. And where is their world headquarters? Here in Phoenix, it I is. guess is the best. We are the the way I would answer that is we are registered uh, in Switzerland in Geneva. Um, but our operational headquarters uh, for the, the bulk of our, our operations is here in the Phoenix, Arizona. So in, have you been to Switzerland, to their headquarters there? I have been to Switzerland, but I did not get down to Geneva. So, <laughs> so we, we, have a, we have an affiliate office there that raises funds. Really and truly the, the organization, um, the, the leadership of the organization is here in Phoenix. So is it out of the Reformed Church then, being Switzerland, or doesn't that have anything to do with it? No, that does not. That's just, uh, when I say that registration in Switzerland, that's actually okay. for um, non-governmental organizations like ours. That's the standard okay. um, for, you know, you have your registration in a neutral country, for one thing, and Switzerland's okay. neutral, so that's... <laughs> well, you're a well-traveled gal, that's for sure. What has been your favorite place to visit outside of the United States? Oh, gosh, that's so hard. Um, I mean, I love Bolivia. Bolivia is, there's a corner of my heart that will always be Bolivian. Um, it's mi patria adoptada, we would say, my, my adapted, adopted homeland. Um, Humble, kind people. Yeah, I, lo I love that area. Um, I, I loved Ethiopia. I spent a lot of time in Thailand at one point. Um, I haven't, I've not yet found anywhere I've gone to that I didn't like for some reason or, on, or another. And geographically, what would you say would be the highlight of your travels as far as what you've seen that's been the height of your geographical travels? 
Well, I've always had a long time love for Latin America. I have to say that has got a special place in my heart. I had to fight to learn Spanish as a high school student. It wasn't easy um, growing up in southeastern Michigan to find a Spanish class to even be in. And so uh, that anytime I go there, that's where I feel like my heart is, is most uh, most interested and most alive. But I love the whole world. Yeah, and it's beautiful country. And we get... We have such an elitism about ourselves in America. Like, we're the best country. We're the most beautiful. We are the, you know, and really, in truth, there are so many beautiful countries that are just breathtaking in their geography and Mm -hmm. and the panorama and the beauty of their history and culture. So we need to understand that, I think, and embrace that a little more and get a little more of a global feeling for, you know, the outside world out there. And as you said, why these people are coming here, it's not always good. Sometimes they hopefully would be able to stay in their own country and have an impact and have a difference and have a change of life or something that helps them there. But then when they do get here, we need to help them. Mm-hmm. So yes. here we are with uh, Food for the Hungry. And tell me what their platform is, how they operate here in Arizona. Well, Arizona is just the the central point for an organization that we're working at this point in more than 20 countries worldwide. Um, we don't actually do, we're not doing work in the United States of the type that we do worldwide, um, other than getting people involved, which is very important to get people involved in, in solving some of those, those problems in other countries. Uh, there are really four main focuses focus areas of our work, um, health, education, uh, disaster uh, relief and response, and income generation. And uh, in those, those four areas, we'll go into a country um, and we will uh, work to determine where the neediest people are within the countries. Uh, we go in by invitation. People say, hey, we see the work that you do. We'd like you to come in and do it. And then uh, we will go in and, and work with the community leaders to determine what it is that they're interested in working on, what are the issues in that community, what does that community have to offer to be able to work toward these things, something very important. You start with what, the, what assets a community has and what they can build upon to be able to make life better for their children. And that's our focal point really is how can we make life better for children? How can we help children thrive? So everything we do is, is, is helping that, helping the parents may help them thrive, helping leaders help the children thrive, uh, working with local churches where the churches exist to be able to help children thrive and grow. So the goal is to help people where they are. Absolutely. Do you work at all with people that have been transposed here then? We do not as an organization. Okay. That is not our, not our okay. call. So you're not a local organization, but you are locally based here for a global organization that goes out into the worldwide community yes, that's and helps correct. people where they are. So that's an interesting kind of twist on generally the kind of charities that we have here on this program today. Mm-hmm. It's interesting to think about our world in a more global, global mindset. Mm-hmm. So tell me exactly what happens uh, for a person who wants to get involved in this kind of work or organization. Is it all, is it all donation-based? Are there people who actually work for the organization? What is the setup there as far as your organization goes? Well, giving is one way that people can get involved in being a faith-based organization, a Christian organization. We also um, really uh, enjoy having people praying for us on a daily basis. That's really helpful. Uh, we do have a short-term teams ministry uh, where people are, are going on teams for um, anywhere from seven days to two weeks. Uh, in some of the countries where we serve to learn more about how to how we do community development and and then helping those uh, communities that they're in uh, to be able to uh, uh, develop um, themselves it could be anything from helping them to to build a school to doing um, some work with the children in the school something like that whatever the community again needs and wants uh, they're partnering together with them to do that work uh, I know that kids today all need generally service activities for everything that they do. Mm-hmm. So this would be a great way for kids to get their service hours and to become involved in, you know, in a wonderful mission too. Most of the people who would go with us are adults. It's um, um, but and that's still that's wonderful. Um, that and, and we do have some. Um, we have certain stipulations for kids who are underage uh, to be able to go with us as well. But they probably um, could go with their family. They would go with their family exactly. Yeah. So it's um, it is more of an adult. Uh, it is definitely an, a, an adult activity okay. um, for the most part. Uh, but that is a way for people. That it's not just going to give and not get what you get out of it, but um, you give so much just by going over. You make people think that you care for them. Um, I, today I, I had a story from someone where the woman's name was spelled several different ways in the story. I just got a raw story from the field, and it was partly because she's never had to write her name down. No one cared enough about her to write her name down. And so this is the first time that anybody's 
tried, in English anyway, tried to write her name down. And I will get that with communities sometimes. So when you show up like that from somebody here in Phoenix, Arizona, and you show up overseas to a place that people can't necessarily spell because they've never needed to, what you're saying is I care in a big way. You, your home is not forgotten. You as a person, you are not forgotten. Well, you certainly have a worldwide opportunity out there to go to the different countries. Where's the farthest that you go with your organization? The farthest from Phoenix? From, a, from the United States. From yeah. the United States? Uh, I mean, distance-wise, I'll be, I'm headed to Bangladesh in May. That's wow. it's a 14-hour time difference. So I think that's probably about the biggest time difference that we have. So the Southeast Asia from here is, is directly the other side of the planet. Have you found it easy to get in? Have you had problems? What are some of the situations that you've um, encountered on your, on your missions? Uh, it's usually because we have most of the people who work for Food for the Hungry don't look like me to be, and this is radio, so you can't see what I look like, but um, most of the people are, um, they're not Americans. They're uh, people who are working within their own country. Over 90% of our staff are working in their country of origin. And that means that when I go to visit Bangladesh, I think we only have two non-Bangladeshis on a staff of about 200 people. So uh, they know what they're doing. It's not really difficult to travel there because it's their country. I'm going in as a, as a guest of theirs. So you're enlisting the locals. I oh, absolutely. Always. We do everything with lo the decision-making, the work within the community. When I worked in Bolivia, I wasn't doing the work in the communities. I did a little bit of teaching of English. But I was supervising and acting as a bridge with the people in this country where the money was coming from. Um, and uh, where the money and other types of support were coming from. I was the bridge person. The people who speak the language and who know the culture are the ones that are working in the community. Well, that's certainly the best way to, to do, to, best way to be effective, I would imagine. It's too. much more effective. It's much more cost effective. And for people effective. coming yep. in telling you what to do or trying to understand your lifestyle, which you don't really understand. I mean, you can see it and understand it from a distance, yeah. but it's the people who are right there in the community Absolutely. that can understand it the best. Yeah. So you said you had a fourfold prong of your mission and what you accomplish. Mm -hmm. And go over that again, would you? Well, the, the four areas that we're involved in, uh, we break it down into health, which is where malaria falls into, uh, education, income generation, and disaster preparedness and response are the four areas. Uh, and each country that we work in will have some aspect of their work that falls into those four areas. It's four different ways to protect children. Now, disaster preparedness, tell me about that a little bit. That sounds very interesting. Disaster preparedness is the fact that you can go into a community and you can, uh, you can identify ways that the community is vulnerable from a disaster. And, for example, as again, as I'm going into Bangladesh in a couple of weeks, um, I'll be going into an area that's right on the Bay of Bengal, right on the coast. And uh, with any time they have a storm, those people are extremely vulnerable to flooding and to high winds. And so we'll talk with them about how, you, how can you construct a house that doesn't get totally taken apart in the winds? How can you identify whether your community is in a place where you probably shouldn't be living? And how can you then work with people to be able to move them to a place where they're safer? How can you protect your water, um, water system? And how can you be ready when a disaster happens? Uh, so you're being proactive about their future with them. Absolutely. Them, helping them think for the future yep. and think ahead and yep. things like that. Absolutely. And that's exactly where, where we would go with malaria is that we, what we're doing is we're trying to prevent malaria. It's not... You can cure it, but we're trying to work on the very front of end, front end of things so that people don't get malaria to begin with. So malaria is still a worldwide issue. I know that in the United States we like to think that that's kind of an old-fashioned medical issue, but it's still very much an issue throughout the world, is it not? Absolutely, absolutely. There are hundreds of thousands of people who die each year from malaria worldwide. The most recent statistics would say that the World Health Organization estimates that in the, the last year that we had figures, half a million people died of malaria and most of them were children in Africa. That's awful. It's disgraceful. And it is a completely preventable disease. That's the thing that's and treatable when people get it as well. So a death from malaria is something that really should not be happening. So we have World Malaria Day coming up, April 25th. This year's theme, Invest in the Future, Defeat Malaria. And how exactly now is your organization involved in that? We're very involved on the, on the community and right down to the household level because it starts with the family. It starts with making sure that mosquitoes aren't living in the area where the family is living. 
And that often means having to clean up your house, clean up the area around the house. Uh, one of the, the biggest ways that you can eliminate mosquitoes is to make sure that they don't have the water to breed in. And it's making people aware of the fact Moisture that they can humidity. do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because malaria, malaria, mosquitoes must have the, that water. Uh, and so when it rains, usually what you'll see is the incidence of malaria spikes two to three weeks after the, the seasonal rains hit, for example. And it's because people are not, they're allowing the water to collect someplace on their property. Hmm. There's a, a type of mosquito out there, for example, that can breed in the amount of water that's held in the um, hoof print of a horse. That's all it takes. I know that I'm from the Midwest, originally Wisconsin, and they have a, their mosquito issue is pretty bad this mm -hmm. time of year. It's hard to even go outside. I don't remember growing up having such an issue with that. Maybe as I get older, I'm noticing it more. But does it seem like mosquitoes have grown in population through our lifetime? Well, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert in epidemiology, so mm -hmm. I really don't have any, wouldn't be able to, um, to talk about that. I do know that, um, uh, you know, one of the things that is affected malaria, that affects malaria is when you have a lot of people together who have malaria, that spikes the incidence up. So it's something we have to be careful of. And as we see large populations of refugees, for example, in an area, uh, you will see um, malaria is one of the diseases that could become more prevalent just as, as things get more crowded. Okay. Now, it doesn't matter whether there's more mosquitoes or not. It's okay, just that you so have, have spreading people. spreading more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have people. And I, um, I remember um, traveling to Ethiopia in 2000 uh, where we had a large displacement of people going from the southern part of the country toward the northern part of the country uh, just because there was no rain in the south. And they were herders looking for grass and rain for their cattle. And um, so there, and it was, it was quite dangerous health-wise because there were large groups of people in a place that couldn't sustain them mm. and uh, displaced, living very, very close together. And there were a lot of diseases that were going on. And furthermore, they ended up, because no one wanted them in the area, they ended up camping right smack in the middle of a, of a, of a riverbed that is, was collecting the water. So here they were very, very vulnerable. They had traveled hundreds of miles on foot. They were very unhealthy to begin with, and they're sitting there with a mosquito breeding ground right behind them. So one of the things that we did as an organization was worked with the community leaders to be able to negotiate with them and put those people someplace that was healthier for them. Because I don't like this statistic that I'm seeing, three out of four people killed by malaria are children under age five. So I would imagine then the children are more susceptible or they, you know, they, their little bodies can't fight it off as well as an adult. So that just is going to help, especially the children, if you move them out of an area like that. That's correct. And it's, it's trying to keep the fever down uh, to begin with. Fever is one of the things that will kill a young child very, very quickly within hours. An adult can maintain mm -hmm. having a fever longer than a child can for various reasons. And that's another reason, another way that Food for the Hungry helps to fight malaria. Number one, we talked about the environment, but the second way that we would help is early identification of the disease so that the children can go in and, and be treated as early as possible. So we have a... a a methodology we call the care group, which is where uh, a mothers, we train a number of mothers in the community who then go back into their community, find 10 friends, train those 10 friends about things like how do you prevent malaria, and then they form small groups. Uh, those 10 mothers will form another 10, and you can see we call that cascade, cascading the training down um, and being able to get the training in there for how to identify malaria. Well, and the fact that people can speak to their own better and more effectively than you can. I mean, that's that's very wise to, to, to get a pyramid effect going where it's trickling down or up, whatever you want to say, into having an effect on more and more people. Yes, absolutely. And, and that way we can train people. How do you detect malaria? And then also setting up another uh, aspect of it is we would be working with community leaders to make sure that the health facilities in the area are equipped to do the test for malaria and to provide the treatment medications, uh, depending on the area. Now, even though we don't have a big issue with that here, and it's not your concern to deal with that in our state, mm -hmm. there is a lot of travel going on. People mm -hmm. are going more places than ever. They're going anywhere and everywhere just for fun, for honeymoons, for, for family travel, for social. What are the signs that you should look for if you have been traveling? Fever, chills, and the fact that you've been in an area where there is malaria. <laughs> it's, it's kind of uh, anytime you, I would get fever and chills. Um, 
I, when I was in a malaria zone. And I did at one point. I got checked out in Kenya. I was on a short-term mission trip to Kenya. Um, I was feeling those symptoms. And uh, my leaders and, and I agreed that I needed to go in and be checked. So I went in and I had the blood test done and um, came out uh, negative, which was really great. Thank I goodness. just had your garden variety something else. But... Um, flu, something like yeah, that. Flu yeah, flu or something. But I had something that was giving me a high fever and, and chills, and so it it's really it, it's really good to to check out those symptoms. But better yet, I mean, is to go prepare. There are things that you can do to prepare. Um, taking malaria prophylaxis is the fancy term for the medications that you take to prepare to go out. And where you need to consult with a doctor, that is a, a prescription drug, and consult with a doctor about what kind of malaria medications are best for you. Uh, and for the area that you're going. There are different kinds of malaria in the world. There are actually four different little bugs, little parasites that cause malaria and different drugs for different parasites. So it depends on where you're going as to what you take. But if you're traveling, where should you be thinking? Where are the hot spots that if someone is taking a vacation now this summer, where should they be especially aware of that? Well, I go on to the, the um, Center for Disease Control websites and look at their maps, but you can kind of see a band right around the equator all the way okay. around if you look at that. It's got to be warm and low. Warm and low and wet. Warm, low, and wet, yeah. And it depends on the time of year. I mean, malaria spikes as to when it's when it's going to be most prevalent in a, in a part of the country. But, you know, malaria is a nasty disease. It can really, really get you. It can damage your liver. It can damage a lot of things. And so um, it's really good to talk with a doctor before you out and, and go out and, and find that. Um, what you can do to prevent it. And I know I was speaking to Marsha, our producer today, and she was telling me that her stepfather had had it and survived, but that he had repercussions the rest of his life. So this is not something to be taken lightly. This is not just the flu that you get over. This has lifelong consequences, mm-hmm. yeah. which is another reason to be on guard and vigilant mm-hmm. about it. Yes, and when you're when you're in the field, now one of the things we'll do for the families as well, and I'll be doing this um, when I'm in Bangladesh and other countries, but using bed nets. Um, you have a pesticide-treated bed net that you can put put over. I mean, they estimate that as soon as you um, uh, as soon as you donate and get a bed net into a family, um, I saw some UN estimates today that were saying that immediate, pretty immediately you'll see a 25% drop in the, wow. in the incidence of malaria just by having a bed net. And bed nets, um, which I love because it's like being a princess for a night. Yeah. You know, you're sleeping under one of those gauzy gauzy bed nets, and they're wonderful. Uh, and but people, they, I sh- I'm sure that people enjoy those and we'll take those you know unlike maybe some other methods that might be difficult for a person to embrace that a person I'm sure will embrace anywhere they usually usually do and um, and the nice thing about bed nets is that they um, also prevent against other diseases as well there's all kinds of creatures out there that you can that can bite you in the middle of the night but here's one thing that's important too is that when you give out a bed net and this is something food for the hungry does it's done with training in conjunction with training the person how to use it and that's one thing that happens with these care groups is then the mother, who's the leader, will go around and check. And she'll even look inside the house and poke her head in. Mm, are you, you don't have that bed net set up quite right, things like that. So that's really important. It's not just throwing the, the bed net at somebody and saying, goodbye, you're taken care of. It's making sure that they're doing the follow-up and using it. If someone listening today wanted to donate bed nets because that was a nice, visible, visual way to give something to someone, about how much does it cost to get a bed net into a home? Right now we are offering uh, the opportunity for people to donate to bed nets on the Food for the Hungry website at fh.org if you go to our gift catalog. And it's $6 for a bed net. And that can save a life. Yep. That's amazing. That's a well-spent $6 when you consider Absolutely. you can either go into the grocery store and buy a fancy coffee drink. And I know that's such an old cliche that people use, but it's still true. You can spend, a, get a couple of burgers, or you can save possibly a life and maybe a child's life, too. It's so important. That's right. That's the amazing thing about those about the bed nets is they are so affordable. Uh, and that's really when, when the other thing is that we'll start working with people. You heard me mention income generation earlier. When we start working with people on income generation, that's one of the things we're precisely trying to do is raise their income, usually through increasing their um, agricultural production, so that they have money to buy a bed net. So they're not dependent on the handout of a bed net, but that, that they're available and they can use that money to buy that. Everything from bed nets to toothpaste, you know, to increase their their mm-hmm. dental health and um, school fees that the kids have to pay for. So they're all, everything's really tied in together as to when you're talking about malaria eradication, there's a lot of factors that you can, you can help. And it's a better. ripple effect. You can make life worse by having a malaria infection in the community, or you can make life better by 
getting rid of it and then the the consequences of that just make life better and better yeah, as you yeah, go through absolutely tell me your website again the website is fh.org very simple and if someone wants to go on there they can donate they can specifically donate. I'm kind of interested in this because I'm thinking it could be a nice family project. You sure. know, As I said, with kids, you like to do a charitable project and let them see that something, rather than taking $6 and putting it in, which is important, into mm-hmm. a food bank uh, bucket or something, but to give give this and know that you have a specific destination and they can see that and feel that they know they're doing something. I think that's really effective. They, they can do that all the time. We have people who do that, who form groups together, for example, and raise money, and then they use our catalog item to be able to donate what they've raised toward bed nets. And I'm thinking, too, again, you did mention that this is not really something that kids go on generally. This is not the kind of mission trip that kids would go on. But this could be a nice group project, school project, Sunday school project. This would be a nice way that, you know, for kids to get involved at a low cost to them and their families, but still to have an impact and get them thinking about the problems. Absolutely, absolutely. And the other thing I wanted to, to add, too, um, that F- Food for the Hungry brings to um, these communities and with relation to malaria is a sense of hope. Because malaria, since it's a parasite, it doesn't work like a virus where you get the fever and that kills the virus and then you're done. Malaria, it goes over and over again until you get treated. Uh, you it's will, ongoing. It's, it's a cycle. You will. You get the fever, and then the fever does kill some of the parasites, but they're still there, and they begin to multiply again within your liver, and then you start to feel sick again. And the hopelessness that people have about malaria can be really bad. It, it attacks your red blood cells. It makes you feel anemic. Uh, it keeps people out of school. It keeps people from working. You get paralyzed. You get paralyzed by it. And so part of what what, an orga- what Food for the Hungry and organizations like ours will do is to help people say, you know what, you can stop this cycle. And it takes a lot of work to get people mentally to think that they are empowered to stop that cycle. So just think about that. A bed net, you say, ah, oh, it's $6, you know, it's a, it's a cup of Starbucks coffee. But what you're really doing, when you hand that bed net to somebody and you've got a Food for the Hungry staff member behind you on that, who's, you know, you're helping us to be able to do that, you're enabling us to be able to do that, you're also enabling us to be able to give hope to someone to say, you can stop this cycle. Well, it's wonderful. There's nothing more important than helping people and saving children. So God bless for the work that you're doing there. I want you once again to give us your website. The website is fh.org. And you can get on there. You can peruse the website, think about how you want to help. But I think one of the greatest, uh, again, opportunities that you've told us about today is to get on there and give a bed net and start the process of helping make a difference in the world. It's just such a minimal cost to be able to do something and be effective. Thank you again. That website one more time, Beth fh.org. All right. Well, thank you so much, Beth Allen with Food for the Hungry. We hope to have you back again and talk some more about your interesting work. Thank you so much today. We appreciate that. God bless and good best wishes in your future, all your future work for this great organization. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. And we'll be right back. I'm Valerie Moore. This is 